Good evening. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Robert Ellsberg. As most of you probably know, he is the publisher of Orbis Books, the publishing house known for its groundbreaking books in the areas of Christian spirituality and Catholic social thought. Many of you know Mr. Ellsberg through his daily entries on saints in Give Us This Day. He is the author of such award-winning books as Blessed Among Us, Day by Day with Saintly Witnesses, All Saints, Daily Reflections on Saints, Prophets, and Witnesses for Our Time, and The Saints' Guide to Happiness. A former managing editor of The Catholic Worker, Mr. Ellsberg has devoted much of his life to promoting the legacy of Dorothy Day, including the editing of her diaries, letters, and selected writings. He has also written and edited books on many other spiritual guides, including Oscar Romero, Thomas Merton, Gandhi, Thich Nhat Hanh, Flannery O'Connor, Carlo Corretto, Charles de Foucault, and Sister Helen Prejean. Those of you who are familiar with Mr. Ellsberg's work as an editor and publisher know that he has made it his life work to encourage and support writers who engage readers in exploring the global dimensions of faith, inviting dialogue with diverse cultures and traditions, and serving the cause of reconciliation and peace. His research and reflection have given him deep insight into what it means to be holy in today's world. In choosing the topic for this presentation, Mr. Ellsberg told us that he believes that spiritual guides do not show us how to be like them, but how to be more ourselves, how to find our own hidden gifts, how to respond to the sacred voice that issues from our own hearts and from the challenge of our time and place. I have no doubt that his insights tonight will expand our understanding of holiness as we continue our own journeys of faith. Robert, we are so grateful that you have taken time out of your very busy schedule to be with us tonight for the inaugural lecture of the J.T. Vincent Luce series. It is surely a match made in heaven. No pun intended, but <laughs> we could not be more pleased, so welcome. Good evening, welcome, and thank you very much for that introduction and for this invitation. When Sister Margaret uh, first proposed this, which was quite a long time ago, and I thought, well, it's just across the river, I guess, uh, I guess I could do that. And I said, how many people do you think will come? And she said, well, it could be 25 or 30 or 40 or something like that. And then she just told me the other day that there were you know, over 100 people or 125 people, I don't know how many people are here. And I thought, oh gosh, I, I really better step up my game a little bit. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so I, I, I hastily put together a little PowerPoint presentation so that if you get bored listening to me, you have some pictures to look at. And I did it so quickly this afternoon, and I, of course I'm dealing with a lot of saints, and only as I sat down and looked at your faces here did I realize I didn't have a picture of a single Dominican. Uh, <laughs> just about everybody else. Um, <laughs> Um, but uh, you look at Dominican saints uh, every day, so you don't you don't need to see that. And uh, and I'm also very honored uh, to, here to be uh, at a, a lecture that honors uh, Dr. Liu. Uh, what a what a wonderful story! I'm I'm I'm, I'm it is a privilege to speak uh, on this occasion. I had. Um, Again, when Sister Margaret said, well, what do you want to talk about? And, uh, and I, I just popped into my head, uh, Dorothy Day and Oscar Romero. And the new face of holiness in our time. Of course, I could have picked lots of other people. But I've been thinking about Dorothy Day ever since I was 19 and I dropped out of college to work with her at the Catholic Worker back in the mid-1970s. 
And now I've lived to see her cause for canonization underway and actually to serve on the commission that is charged with responsibility for putting that together. The story of Oscar Romero has haunted and inspired me for almost as long. In a real sense, it was the impact of his death that led me over 30 years ago to join the staff at Orbis Books, the publishing arm of Orbis of Marian Old Fathers and Brothers, uh, which was originally founded to amplify voices uh, from people like Oscar Romero, uh, Christian voices from Latin America and from the margins. Three years ago, I attended his beatification in El Salvador, and uh, as you know, probably he's scheduled to be canonized later this year. So for most of my life, I've looked on Dorothy Day and Oscar Romero as models of a new kind of holiness, I think especially necessary for our time. Now I'll get back to them in a minute, but let me shift gears uh, just now. Because suddenly, since the time I agreed to give this talk, the subject of holiness has become especially topical, in fact, this very month. I'm referring to the uh, publication of a new apostolic exhortation by Pope Francis, the third of his papacy, called Rejoice and Be Glad on the Call to Holiness in Today's World. Any of you read this yet? Read, had the opportunity to read it? Well, I hope you'll see, soon you'll, you can purchase your own copy. Uh, you're the first to see this cover. Uh, as soon as we heard that the, 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 this document was coming out, I hastened to write to the Vatican and get uh, permission to, to do a, uh, an, our own edition of it. And I got my friend uh, Jim Martin, whom I, I think many of you know, to write an afterward, and I wrote the introduction. And in about two weeks, we had it all typeset and the cover. And I think as of tomorrow, it's going to go live uh, for as a Kindle uh, ebook edition on, on Amazon uh, with the actual printed book uh, available in June. I don't think we've ever rushed a book uh, that, that quickly. Uh, it feels as if uh, his, this document seemed to introduce a new and wider context for my reflections this evening. Since the early days of Christianity, the church has venerated those men and women who by their heroic faith and love exemplified the gospel challenge. These saints made the gospel concrete. They walked the path prepared by Christ and reminded others of what it means to be a true disciple. Over time, the Vatican assumed responsibility for the official naming of saints, introducing the complicated process of beatification and canonization. In the course of many centuries, thousands of names were added to this official list. In fact, about a thousand of them just in the time of Pope John Paul II, who, as you know, was a prodigious dynamo when it came to naming saints. Pope Francis has continued this tradition, if at a slower pace. Among the notable saints he has canonized are two recent popes, John XXIII and John Paul II himself, with Paul VI soon to follow. The parents of Saint Therese of Lisieux, the first husband and wife recognized for their holiness. Let that sink in. And Mother Teresa of Calcutta. But his new apostolic exhortation is not about the naming or veneration of saints. Instead, it's about the universal call to holiness. If it seems an unfamiliar or implausible idea to many people to say that all Christians are called to holiness, part of the blame may lie in the process of canonization itself. The singling out of certain exceptional Christians for veneration may foster the impression that saints are altogether different from the rest of us, a kind of perfect person, worthy of admiration, but no more capable of our imitation than Olympic athletes or musical prodigies. Their luminous reputation for miracles, feats of asceticism, or heroic martyrdom further set them apart from most ordinary Christians. Most of us are mostly familiar with such figures through stained glass windows, statues, or holy cards. On that basis, we might assume that saints are typically nuns, priests, or bishops clothed in religious garb who spent their lives in prayer 
or as the Pope says, swooning in mystic rapture, maybe thinking of, of <laughs> the ecstasy, so-called, of St. Teresa. In church, we may take their presence for granted as part of the religious decor, little supposing that their lives have much relevance to our own daily struggles and concerns. In other words, we make the mistake of thinking that holiness is the business of canonized saints and not the vocation of all who call themselves Christians. To be a Christian, however, is to be a Christ follower. This is a process over a lifetime of putting off the old person and putting on Christ. It's a matter of conforming our lives to the pattern and mystery of his life. On that basis, St. Paul referred to all the members of the local church as the saints, not because they were likely to be canonized, which didn't really exist at the time. They were saints by virtue of their calling to be saints, their desire to be saints. Why else call oneself a Christian? Pope Francis did not invent the notion that everyone is called to holiness. That, in fact, is the title of a section of Lumen Gentium, the Vatican II document on the church, which Francis cites. Strengthened by so many and such great means of salvation, all the faithful, whatever their condition or state, are called by the Lord, each in his or her own way, to that perfect holiness by which the Father himself is perfect. Francis goes on to emphasize that line, each in his or her own way. The call to holiness is not a matter of conforming ourselves to some cookie cutter pattern or imitating certain heroic examples. I could mention Thomas Aquinas or Catherine of Siena or... <laughs> we are not called to become another St. Francis or another Mother Teresa, but to be holy in our own way, which means being our best or true self. Regardless of whether we are priests, nuns, or lay people, regardless of whether we are celibate or married, of exceptional abilities, or completely average, there's a path to holiness that takes account of our particular gifts and duties in life, a path that is different for each one of us. And all Christians are called to walk that path whose goal is simply the fullness of Christian life, the fullness of love. For this we were created, as Francis says, not to settle for a bland and mediocre existence. We are, of course, inspired and assisted by the example and encouragement of those who have advanced before us on this path, the great cloud of witnesses who surround us. But as Francis makes clear, these witnesses are not just the great official saints. They may include, he says, our mothers, grandmothers, or other loved ones. Their lives may not always have been perfect, yet even amid their faults and failings, they kept moving forward and proved pleasing to the Lord. As he has in other sermons and writings, Pope Francis speaks of those who represent the middle class of holiness, not the exceptional prodigies, but just your average kind of holiness, everyday holiness. Those whose acts of love and fidelity may earn little notice in history. He reflects on the holiness present in our next door neighbors and in the patience of God's people, in those parents who raise their children with immense love, in those men and women who work hard to support their families, in the sick, in the elderly religious who never lose their smile. Some smiles here. <laughs> Faces of you saints. We are all, he says, called to be holy by living our lives with love and by bearing witness in everything we do, wherever we find ourselves. The subject of Pope Francis's first apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, was the call of all Christians to be missionary disciples. In his new document, he connects that theme of mission to the theme of holiness. Our essential mission in life is to find our own path to holiness, which regardless of its form is, he says, nothing other than charity lived to the full. Our great task in life is to discover and live out, he says, the message that God wants to speak to the world by our lives. <clears throat> 
I, lo I love that line. The message that God wants to speak to the world by our lives. In doing so, we do not become either faultless or less than human. Holiness, holiness, he says, is an encounter between your weakness and the power of God's grace. I have been writing about saints for over 20 years. It's been that long since I published my first book here, All Saints, Daily Reflections on Saints, Prophets, and Witnesses for Our Time. As Sister Margaret mentioned, it's been added to that with uh, five or six other books um, over the years. Um, my most recent, Blessed Among Us, based on the daily reflections I've been writing for almost eight years now uh, on saints for liturgicals publication, Give Us This Day. Excuse me, um, yeah, Give Us This Day. I got that right. <laughs> I'll steer you wrong. But all saints really came from a lifetime of reflection on great souls, people who seemed to live out of the deepest part of their conscience and beckoned us to consider our highest calling as human beings. It was attraction to people like that that led me to drop out of college in 1975 and move to New York City to work with Dorothy Day at the Catholic Worker. Uh, that's, that's literally me there at Dorothy Day. <laughs> I haven't changed that much. I just shaved just the shave this morning. I only I saw this picture uh, last year for the first time. I never knew there was a picture of me with Dorothy Day, and and um, her granddaughter found it and sent it to me, and I, I was just you know stunned uh, to be uh, brought back to her presence, very much the way I remember her, <laughs> if not myself. I ended up spending five years there, the last five years of Dorothy's life. I can't sum up all the lessons I learned there, but among other things, I, uh, I found it broadened and intensified my interest in saints and holy witnesses. Dorothy talked about saints all the time, not just as people from long ago, but like contemporaries, people who faced the same kind of challenges that she faced in her daily life struggling with community and how to remain faithful in the face of hardship, discouragement, experiences of the cross. That's where I learned about people like St. Catherine of Siena and St. Benedict and St. Teresa of Avila and her beloved St. Therese. But those names tended to merge with other people she revered. Gandhi, writers like Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, revolutionaries, activists, even fictional characters who stirred her heart and encouraged her in the struggle to see God and the world in the everyday encounters with her neighbors, and especially in the events of history. It was really my immersion in that community that inspired me to write about saints, and in my book I pretty much followed her sensibility, combining all sorts of traditional and officially recognized saints with other prophets and witnesses. Including, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep in adding Dominicans when I can. can. Uh, the, the great uh, Dominican prophet Bartolome de las Casas, writers, poets, philosophers, and activists. My purpose in writing the book was in part to take the saints down from their pedestals, to show them as actual human beings living in particular circumstances who responded in faith to the challenges of their time. But I had another purpose as well. I hoped to expand the popular understanding of saints and to hold up figures who might represent models of holiness that speak to, to our time in a, in a special way. And what do I mean by that? Previous models of sanctity tended to emphasize a world-denying asceticism. Think of St. Simeon Stylides, who perched for many decades on top of a tower that they, they got larger and larger, and certainly filled people with, with, with great wonder uh, that, that he could do this. In this era of ecological consciousness, when our planet is threatened by greed, waste, and indifference, we need examples of discipline and self-denial that affirm the earth, bodily existence, and our relationship with nature. There are many examples of holiness expressed through the works of charity. We need more examples like Dorothy Day, who combined service to the poor and needy with the struggle for just social structures. Many saints of old operated out of chauvinistic attitudes toward other cultures and religions. Think of the Crusades or the conquest of the Americas. 
We need models of saintliness that seek out and affirm the presence of God in other cultures and religious paths. In a canon of saints that remains dominated by men, we need more examples of female holiness and more examples from outside the cloister, examples of holiness lived out in the ordinary world. Speaking for those who have an ordinary job, an ordinary household, who suffer ordinary sicknesses and ordinary times of grieving, the French missionary Madeleine Delbrel wrote, we the ordinary people of the streets believe with all our might that this street, this world where God has placed us is our place of holiness. I tried to seek out and describe these models. The process of canonization is, is long and complicated. It takes a team of canon lawyers to navigate the process as I'm discovering uh, from the inside now working on this Dorothy Day project. But wouldn't it be great if Jesus himself had outlined a manual for holiness? Well, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Our fixation on canonization and the criteria for naming official saints, which includes orthodoxy and heroic virtue and verified miracles, can distract us from the fact that ultimately the saints simply embodied the criteria for holiness that Jesus provided in his Sermon on the Mount, beginning with the Beatitudes. Francis calls the Beatitudes a Christian's identity card. He might have called them a Christian's job description. Chapter three of his exhortation consists simply of an outline and reflection on the Beatitudes, in which we find, quote, a portrait of the master, which we are called to reflect in our daily lives. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek, those who mourn, the pure of heart, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. As he has so often, Pope Francis points out that these qualities go against the flow of our acquisitive culture, a culture of indifference, distraction, and hunger for novelty that makes it difficult even to see our brothers and sisters, much less to respond to them in love. And yet he reminds us that our salvation ultimately depends on one clear criterion. This is outlined in the famous teaching in Matthew 25. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. This description of the works of mercy has also supplied a job description for many saints and holy people, including St. Vincent de Paul and St. Teresa of Calcutta. It inspired Dorothy Day, founder of the Catholic Worker, not only in her service of the poor, but in her work for social justice and her witness for peace. As she said, the mystery of the poor is this, that they are Jesus, and what we do for them, we do for him. When I read that litany of the Beatitudes, the person I think immediately of is Dorothy Day, who embraced voluntary poverty, who wept over the sufferings of the poor, who organized her life around the practice of mercy, who hungered for God's righteousness, who more than any Catholic of her time claimed the calling of peacemaking, and, for who, for, and who for her witness to God's kingdom was repeatedly jailed and endured suffering. Of course, if she is one day named a saint, she will be a saint with an unusual background having renounced Christianity in her youth and spent her early years engaged in the radical causes of her day. Her friends were anarchists, communists, and assorted literary bohemians. In the aftermath of an unhappy love affair, she had an abortion. That there was always something in Dorothy, some yearning for the transcendent. Like a character in Dostoevsky, she observed, all my life I've been haunted by God. The turning point in her life came when she found herself pregnant and experienced a sense of gratitude, quote, so great that only God could receive it. She decided to have her child baptized. She knew little about Catholic doctrine or theology. She was more influenced by her reading of the lives of the saints and the example of her poor neighbors. Yet her decision to become a Catholic came at a great price. 
separation from the father of her child, a man she deeply loved when he refused to marry. And there was a second loss, a sense of estrangement from the cause of the poor and oppressed. She truly believed that the church was the home of the poor and she admired its many works of charity, but too often the Catholic Church seemed like the bulwark of what she called a social order that made so much charity in the present sense of the word necessary. There was plenty of charity, she said, but too little justice. She longed, she said, to make a synthesis, reconciling body and soul, this world and the next. On December 8, 1932, at the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, you'll have noticed that that very auspicious day, December 8th, she offered a prayer, quote, with tears and anguish, that some way would open up for me to use what talents I possessed for my fellow workers, for the poor. The answer came to her prayer, to her prayer came in her meeting with a Frenchman named Peter Morin, who inspired her to found a lake movement that would promote the radical social message of the gospel. In response, she found that a newspaper, The Catholic Worker, launched on May 1st, 1933, in the heart of the Depression. She also founded Houses of Hospitality, where Christians, embracing voluntary poverty, lived in community with the poor and homeless. There they practiced the works of mercy, feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, while also challenging a social order that gave rise to so much poverty and misery. Her pacifist position, similarly rooted in the teaching and example of Jesus, put her in a very small minority among Roman Catholics. She proclaimed this position during the Spanish Civil War and continued through the Second World War. During the 1950s, she was repeatedly arrested and jailed for protests against preparations for nuclear war. In particular, she was arrested every year for refusing to cooperate with mandatory civil defense drills in New York City, which she saw as rehearsals for mass murder. An early and active opponent of the war in Vietnam, she stood in solidarity with young men who resisted the draft, and she refused to pay federal income taxes that paid for war. Her activism continued into her late years. At the age of 75, she was arrested for joining a picket line with striking farm workers in California. Despite this social radicalism, Dorothy Day always considered herself a loyal and obedient daughter of the church. Her life was rooted in prayer and the sacraments, daily mass, the rosary, meditation on scripture and the breviary. Her recently published diaries, which I edited, document her daily struggles to examine her conscience in light of the call to practice love, patience, mercy, and forgiveness in her encounters with those around her, especially the poor, those she called the insulted and injured. Frequently she spoke of the duty of delight, a discipline to find God in all things, both in moments of hardship and suffering. Uh, as, as well as times of joy. I left the Catholic worker to return to college in the fall of 1980. In November of that year, Dorothy died at the age of 83. In 2000, Cardinal John O'Connor submitted her cause for canonization to Rome. It was accepted and she became known as a servant of God. When Dorothy's cause for canonization was proposed, not everyone was happy. I'm not referring so much to those who felt she was unworthy of being called a saint. These included some who were scandalized by her radicalism or her pacifist position. I don't take that all too seriously. I'm referring more to those who felt that she was indeed holy, but felt somehow that the process of canonization was somehow unworthy of her. Among some of her admirers, there was the feeling that the expensive and legalistic process of canonization would put her on a pedestal she rejected. It might strip her of her radical edge and conform her to some kind of pious image that was inconsistent with her message. My response to this involved several points. The first was to emphasize again the important role of saints in Dorothy's life. Constantly, she invoked the saints as patrons and intercessors. They cropped up in her speech almost as if they were personal acquaintances. 
The saints, as Dorothy spoke of them, were our friends and companions, examples of the gospel in action. She filled the newspaper, her newspaper with their images. She vote, devoted years to writing a biography of St. Therese of Lisieux. In discussing the saints, Dorothy always acknowledged their humanity, their capacity for discouragement and sorrow, their mistakes and failures, along with their courage and faithfulness. There's no doubt that she wished to take them off their pedestals, to show them as human beings who nevertheless represented in their time the ideals and spirit of the gospel. Above all, Dorothy, like Pope Francis, believed that the canonized saints were those who reminded us that we are all called to holiness. We are all called to be saints, she wrote, and we might as well get over our bourgeois fear of the name. We might also get used to recognize the, recognizing the fact that there is some of the saint in all of us, inasmuch as we are growing, putting off the old man and putting on Christ. There is some of the saint, the holy, the divine, right there. One of the things that attracted her to St. Therese was that in her little way, she showed a way of holiness available to all people in all circumstances. From Therese, Dorothy learned that each sacrifice endured in love, each work of mercy, might increase the balance of love in the world. And she extended the principle to the social sphere. Each protest or witness for peace though apparently foolish and ineffective, no more than a pebble in a pond, pebble in a pond, might send forth ripples that could transform the world. Her diaries make it clear how faithfully she applied this teaching in her everyday life, the daily efforts to be more patient, more forgiving, the little decisions to sacrifice her own time, privacy, and comfort for the sake of others. It was the practice of these small daily choices that equipped her for the extraordinary and heroic action she performed on a wider stage. If that's what saints meant for Dorothy, what is the meaning of saints for the church? That's the second point I want to make. It's important to recognize that in canonizing the saint, the church is not bestowing a kind of posthumous honor, like nomination to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or something. <laughs> Canonization does not benefit the saint. It's intended to benefit the church. Dorothy understood this. When a saint is canonized, it represents the church's solemn declaration that the life of at least this servant of God, her message and witness, provides a true and reliable guidepost for our own path of Christian discipleship. Through recognition of certain individuals, actually a very tiny number compared to all those saints known to God, the church enlarges our understanding of the gospel. It provides new models that people can relate to, examples who demonstrated the challenge of discipleship in their time and so challenge us to do the same in our own. As Simon Weil said, however, it's not nearly enough to be a saint. But, quote, we must have the saintliness demanded by the present moment. Early in her life, Dorothy recognized the need for a new kind of saint. Even as a child, she noted how moved she was by the stories of saints who cared for the poor, the sick, the leper. But another question arose in her mind. Where were the saints to change the social order? Not just to minister to the slaves, but to do away with slavery. She answered that question with her life. Nobody coming after Dorothy today would have to ask where to find saints like that. In 1932, in her fateful prayer at the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception, Dorothy sought an answer about how to integrate her faith and her commitment to justice and the cause of the oppressed. She prayed to make a synthesis of body and soul, this world and the next. In effect, she was in search of a model of how to minister to the slaves while doing away with slavery. Many saints had performed the works of mercy and poured themselves out in charity, and Dorothy did the same, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, sheltering the homeless. Ironically, if she'd confined herself to those kinds of activities, her cause for canonization might have accelerated. But she went further. She set herself against, quote, a social order which made so much charity in the present sense of the word necessary. In pursuing this path, she created a new model of discipleship, a new model of holiness, a new way of being a saint 
did, Dorothy did more than anyone to win credibility for this path, and in doing so, she left an enormous gift to the church. No one coming after her would have to imagine what such a saint might look like. But there was more. The second great gift of Dorothy Day to the church was undoubtedly her commitment to the ideal of gospel nonviolence. This ideal was widely recognized in the early church, but after the conversion of Constantine, it was effective, effectively replaced by just war teaching. For many years in season and out, Dorothy was a solitary prophet insisting on the literal meaning of Jesus' words, love your enemies, do good to those that persecute you. No doubt her position was true folly in the eyes of the world. Her position was considered unreasonable, weak, dangerous, and irrelevant. We confess to being fools and we wish that we were more so, she said. There were certainly those who applauded her work with the poor. There were also uh, those who sympathized when she questioned an economic system that produced so much poverty and desperation. There were only a few who joined her in the conviction that the way of Jesus was incompatible with killing. And in 1955, when she was first arrested on the first annual civil defense drill in New York City, the number of Catholics who agreed with such, that such preparations for nuclear war were a crime against God and humanity could evidently fit inside a single police wagon. But for day it all went together. The Catholic worker was an effort to live out the radical implications of Christ's teaching that what we do for the least of our brothers and sisters, whether feed them, torture them, or subject them to nuclear explosions, we do directly to him. By maintaining this witness through one war after another, Dorothy challenged and enlarged the conscience of the church. Successive popes culminating in Pope Francis have grown steadily into the vision she upheld. But in the purity of that vision, she continues to stand ahead, beckoning the church to follow. This might be enough, but I would like to cite another significant gift that Dorothy makes to the church. By far the overwhelming majority of saints, both, back, both in history and in recent times, have been priests and members of religious orders. Of the thousand or so saints beatified or canonized under Pope John Paul II, the majority, apart from martyrs, you won't be surprised perhaps, have been founders or members of religious orders. I, uh, since I write these things every day, I'm, I'm constantly astonished by how many founders of religious orders there are. <laughs> Arguably, this re helps reinforce a stereotype, the notion that re religious life is a prerequisite for holiness. As a lay person, as the founder and leader of a lay movement that has always operated without any official authorization from the church, as the publisher of a newspaper that presumed to take social positions far in advance of the magisterium of her time, Dorothy Day represents quite an unusual and highly can significant candidate for canonization. Her whole life was founded on the conviction that none of us requires any special authorization or permission or mandate to live out the implications of the gospel, to follow Jesus. But another point deserves emphasis here. When the church does occasionally canonize lay people, and there, there are the number of them, these are men and women who in their life experience and spirituality were often virtually indistinguishable from monks or nuns. In Dorothy Day's life, we have a saint who truly experienced the joys and sorrows of family life, of motherhood, and life in a somewhat raucous and mixed community. This is a saint whose conversion was prompted by the experience of pregnancy and the joy of love, the title of the Pope's second apostolic exhortation. Here, too, she represented that synthesis between body and soul, a fully human, embodied form of spirituality and being in the world. Her contribution to the apostolate of the laity is another way in which she exemplified a kind of saintliness demanded by the present moment. Still, there is the worry that in canonizing Dorothy, the church will try to water her down or defang her radical message. Why canonize her? Why not just let her remain a people saint? There are inevitably symbolic, or if you will, political considerations associated with certain canonizations. There is always the question, what lesson or message does the church wish to impart through this canonization? 
I believe this particular era of Pope Francis provides a very special context for promoting the canonization of Dorothy Day. Pope Francis, it seems to me, is the fulfillment of Dorothy's dream. If she'd let her imagination run free, she might have conceived of a pope who took his name from St. Francis, who set out to renew the church in the image of Jesus, promoting the centrality of mercy, reconciliation, and solidarity with those on the margins. So often she criticized ecclesial trappings of power and privilege. How she would have delighted in Francis's gestures of humility, his call for shepherds who have the smell of the sheep, his washing the feet of prisoners, including women and Muslims, his tears on the island of Lampedusa as he contemplated the deaths of nameless immigrants and lambasted the culture of indifference. Before his pilgrimage to the US, I would have liked to tell him about this American woman who so embodied his spirit and vision for the church, but evidently that was not necessary. I was delighted if astonished when he organized his speech before a joint session of Congress around those he called four great Americans and included in that group, uh, which, and in that group, which included Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King Jr., Thomas Merton, surprisingly, he included Dorothy Day. In these times, he said, when social concerns are so important, I cannot fail to mention the servant of God, Dorothy Day, who founded the Catholic Worker Movement. Her social activism, her passion for justice and for the cause of the oppressed were inspired by the gospel, her faith and the example of the saints. He said of such figures as Dorothy Day, they offer us a new way of seeing and interpreting reality which is itself a new way of seeing and interpreting what it means to be a saint. Some have suggested that the new atmosphere under Pope Francis has put some wind in the sails of Dorothy's canonization, but I would put it another way. I think that the cause of Dorothy's canonization helps put wind in the sails of the Pope's agenda. Support for her cause in this context means more than keeping her memory alive. It contributes to the ongoing program of renewal in the church not for its own sake, but for the sake of a wounded world. Let me return now to the example of Oscar Romero and the significance as I see it of his pending canonization. I presume most of you are familiar in basic terms with the story of Oscar Romero, the Archbishop of San Salvador, who was slain on March 24th, 1980, the same year Dorothy died, while he was saying mass. He had been Archbishop for only three years. When he was first installed, he was known as a pious and relatively conventional bishop. He was the choice of the oligarchy for that position. There was nothing at the time of his election that would have predicted that within three years he would be renowned as the outstanding embodiment of the prophetic church, a voice of the voiceless, or as one theologian called him, a gospel for El Salvador. Nor could one foresee that he would be denounced by his fellow bishops, earn the hatred of the rich and powerful of El Salvador, and generate such enmity that he would be targeted for assassination. What changed him? Within weeks of his consecration, he found himself officiating at the funeral of his friend Rutilio Grande, a Jesuit priest of the Archdiocese, who was murdered as a result of his commitment to social justice. Romero was deeply shaken by this event, which marked a new level in the frenzy of violence overtaking his country. In the weeks and months following Grande's death, Romero underwent a profound transformation, some would speak of a conversion, as astonishing to his new friends as it was to his foes. From a once timid and conventional cleric, there emerged a fearless and outspoken champion of justice. His weekly sermons broadcast by radio throughout the country featured an inventory of the week's violations of human rights, casting the glaring light of the gospel on the realities of the day. His increasingly public role as the conscience of the nation earned him not only the bitter enmity of the country's oligarchy, but also the resentment of many of his conservative fellow bishops. There were those among them who muttered that Romero was talking like a subversive. For Romero, the church's option for the poor was not a matter of just pastoral priorities. It was a defining characteristic of Christian faith. He said, a church that does not unite itself to the poor in order to denounce from the place of the poor 
the injustice committed against them is not truly the Church of Jesus Christ. On another occasion he said, on this point there is no possible neutrality. We either serve the life of Salvadorans or we are accomplices in their death. We either believe in a God of life or we serve the idols of death. On March 23, 1980, the day before his death, he appealed directly to members of the military, calling on them to refuse illegal orders. In the name of God, in the name of our tormented people whose cries rise up to heaven, I beseech you, I beg you, I command you, stop the repression. The next day, as he was saying mass in the chapel of the Carmelite Cancer Hospital where he lived, a single shot was fired from the rear of the chapel. Romero was struck in the heart and died within minutes. For Romero, who had clearly anticipated his fate, there was never any doubt as to the meaning of such a death. In an interview two weeks before his assassination, he said, I have frequently been threatened with death. I must say that as a Christian, I don't believe in death, but in the resurrection. If they kill me, I shall rise again in the Salvadoran people. Martyrdom is a great gift from God that I do not believe I have earned. But if God accepted the sacrifice of my life, then may my blood be the seed of liberty and a sign of the hope that will soon become a reality. A bishop will die, but the church of God, the people, will never die. For many years, the question of naming Romero a saint was clouded with controversy. You might think it was not a great brain puzzle to call a, a an archbishop who was killed at the altar while saying mass, a martyr, I think he was perhaps only the second uh, bishop killed in a church since uh, Thomas Beckett. But it took until 2015 for the Vatican to issue a decree declaring that he was a martyr whose death, quote, was not caused by motives that were simply political, but by hatred for a faith that, imbued with charity, would not be silent in the face of the injustices that relentlessly and cruelly slaughtered the poor and their defenders. Let me unpack that a little bit. For many years, many church officials had suggested that Romero didn't die as a true martyr in so-called hatred of the faith in odium fide, but because he got himself mixed up in politics. The Vatican might have skirted the question of politics by focusing on Romero's virtues as a pious and holy churchman, and yet that's not what happened. By the decree of martyrdom, the church recognized that his death, like that of Jesus, was a consequence of his witness to the kingdom of God, or if you will, his faithful proclamation of the gospel. In El Salvador, an overwhelmingly Catholic country named for the Savior, Romero and thousands of other martyrs were not killed simply for confessing membership in the church or for proclaiming the creed. They died because their understanding of the gospel put them in solidarity with the oppressed and in opposition to the structures of injustice. Their faith had made them dangerous to the power structures of their society. In a society animated by odium poporum, hatred of the poor, such faith caused them, as Romero put it, to take on the same fate as the poor. As I said in relation to Dorothy Day, there is inevitably some political dimensions to the naming of saints. I believe that to proclaim Romero a martyr a victim of odium fide was to make a leap of amor fide, of love of the faith that he embodied, a love for the church, that is, the people, as he put it, for which he offered his life. Truly to recognize Romero as a martyr is to embrace his model of holiness and his proclamation of the gospel without compromise or apologies. In his beatification and now canonization, Romero too continues to walk ahead of the church, beckoning us forward on the path to Jerusalem, which is the path of Jesus, clearing the way toward a church in Pope Francis's words that is poor and for the poor. Let me conclude by returning to Pope Francis's new exhortation, Gaudate et Exultate, which adds another element to his remarkable teaching ministry.
Along with his other exhortations, homilies, and writings, it offers another dimension to his ongoing program to renew the mission of the church for today's world. This is not, as some critics would have it, a challenge to orthodoxy or an antinomian assault on Catholic doctrine. It is a call to Christians to live and bear witness to the joy of the gospel. If you read the document carefully, you can see that his priorities are to some extent revealed in those words and images that hold a negative valence in his vocabulary. Rigidity, dogmatism, complacency, introversion, abstraction, legalism, certainty. In contrast, there are those words that signal his positive agenda, joy, boldness, freedom, discernment, and above all, mercy. To those words, he adds in this document another key word, holiness. Contrary to any connotation of fusty piety, this holiness is simply a realization of that fullness of life that Christ came to share with the entire world. As Pope Francis makes clear, the obstacles to holiness arise from many aspects of our consumerist culture, which is so, so easily breeds self-preoccupation, complacency, indifference. But the obstacles may also arise through elements in the church that try to pin down the spirit and lock it up with an old forms and antiquated ways of doing things. When Christ knocks on the door, he's not only on the outside trying to get in, as the Pope says, he may be asking us to let him loose from our own self-centeredness to carry on his mission in the world. For Francis, the question of holiness is directly related to the question of mission, both the mission of the church and the mission of each individual. It is what we are called to be, and from that, what we are called to do. A church that does not call its members to holiness or fails to show what that means in the world is failing in its fundamental reason for being. But as Francis reminds us, the path to holiness is not simply in great and heroic deeds. It is achieved in small deeds and in simple steps, whether by St. Therese of Lisieux in her Carmelite monastery or Dorothy Day in her apostolate of mercy and peacemaking. Pope Francis names many great canonized saints in his document. It's one thing to focus on figures long since dead whose memory is crowned with justice. But before St. Francis of Assisi was St. Francis, he was just Francesco de Bernardone, the wealthy son of a cloth merchant. Before he became St. Ignatius, Inigo Lopez de Loyola was a vain young soldier. Before she became Mother Teresa, Sister Agnes was simply an Albanian nun working in her order's school in India. All of them started somewhere in some unremarkable way before taking a step into the unknown responding to a voice that seemed to call them farther, deeper. As Pope Francis says, we are frequently tempted to think that holiness is only for those who can withdraw from ordinary affairs to spend much time in prayer. That is not the case. We are all called to be holy by living our lives with love and by bearing witness in everything we do, wherever we find ourselves. Wherever we are, in whatever state in life, the same voice, voice that spoke to the saints also calls to us. We may not follow as far as they did, no matter if we only take the first small steps. The only question is, when we hear that call, how shall we answer? Thank you very much. Yes, I'd be very happy to take questions. I, I, are there are there microphones available, or how we just have to shout? Oh, there's one back there. Okay. Thank you so very much for your wonderful lecture. First, to set your con conscience at ease, you did have a picture of a Dominican saint on your book, you have Martin de Porres, uh -oh. on the cover of all saints. So there you have it. I just want to make that comment and say thank you so very much for an inspiring lecture. Thank you very much.
I brought a magazine with me. It's called The Sun. And on the last page, it has many, many quotes of many, many people. One quote I have, I read. It's from Dorothy Day. We need always to be thinking and writing about poverty. For if we are not among its victims, its reality fades from us. We must talk about poverty because people insulated in their own comfort lose sight of it. Poverty was um, a theme of uh, constantly in her, her writings, and she said that there were, you know, kind of two aspects of it. There was the voluntary poverty. Uh, the attitude speaks of being poor in spirit, um, emptying yourself to be available to rely on on, on on God's love, and the kind of freedom that comes from that. But she didn't become romantic of, of, about that because she also immersed herself in, in real, actual poverty among the poor. Um, and I had just a little taste of that. And that meant not, you know, the poverty of a well-scrubbed, you know, monastery, but, but bed bugs and lice and foul smells and disagreeable people being kind of exposed to the the raw, ragged edge of the life of the poor. Uh, I think that Dorothy, you know, with Pope Francis, who took that name deliberately, uh, Pope Francis, he, when he was named, you know, Pope, he said, someone whispered to him, remember the poor. He said, immediately St. Francis came into my mind. And so it, taking on that name for him was not just, a, you know, a, 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 no coincidence that maybe that no other pope before him had taken that name because it's set such a high bar. Uh, pope Francis was known for rejecting all pomp and all privilege and all luxury of any kind. And whatever you can say of many holy and canonized popes, most of them have not been averse to a, a little bit of luxury, a little bit of pomp. Uh, and Pope Francis made it clear that this was not just a matter of just simple you know, acts of humility, carrying his own bags or living in a guest house or something like that, um, but constantly you know, opening the church to hear the cry of the poor uh, and to touch, as he said, the wounds of Christ, because that's, you know, that identification of the, of the poor with the body of, suffering body of Christ is so, is so important to St. Francis and to Dorothy Day and I think to Pope Francis as, as well. When you take a kind of Franciscan lens in reading the gospel, you become very aware of certain themes that you might skim over otherwise or not hear about preach too much in church. The fact that Jesus spent so much time with people who were literally poor, who were sick, who were marginalized, who were outcast, who were shunned, who were untouchable. He also there he encountered powerful and rich people who by and large wanted to kill him. <laughs> And yet that kind of measure, that image of Jesus as the poor man had tended to get lost in the church with, you know, the worship of a, of a Christ on the throne and a church that kind of identified with power. Uh, and St. Francis kind of pressed this sort of reset button on Christianity by reforming the church, renewing the church precisely by calling to mind the poor man Jesus. So... Dorothy took her stand among the poor in order to show solidarity, but also to, in the struggle, to work for a society in which there wouldn't be so many poor people. And she felt the beginning of overcoming that kind of poverty was, was solidarity, was mercy, was sharing bread, was companionship. And uh, not just, you know, championing the cause of the poor as many of her radical friends had, 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 had done, but knowing them as friends, knowing them as neighbors, members of her family.
So I'm glad you picked up that, that quote. It's very, very important to Dorothy Day. Um, <clears throat> trying to, to formulate this question. Uh, your reflection on the fact that we have politicized and, and uh, created this dichotomy on, on issues like poverty, like immigration, like uh, criminal justice reform and so forth, to where Catholics are so divided, and uh, I happen to go to a number of churches here in Rockland County and upstate and in Brooklyn. Uh, that's a beautiful church in Brooklyn, uh, St. Boniface. Uh, but where, where priests are so afraid to talk about our responsibilities in poverty and our responsibilities to stand up to racism and you know this cruelty to people in need and you know and so many notable catholics in powers of position in washington and elsewhere who just will not recognize that this is a a duty uh, do you have some thoughts about what how that happened and where we what we do about it well I mean, it is a difficult question. The the uh, over time, in many aspects of it, one on the one hand, uh, a church that at one time was made up of immigrants and working class people, gradually became more assimilated into middle class American life, enjoying the upward mobility and identifying uh, with then that sense of having arrived and having a kind of a stake, and then becoming nervous about those who are coming after us, uh, trying to get a little piece of what we have, uh, that there's some pie that we can't, you know, that's not big enough to share. Uh, there's, there's that aspect of it. There's also the aspect in which for so um, long, you know, in recent years, I think there has been such a narrowing of focus or optics around what are defining Catholic issues. And um, I have to say, I think you know, bishops played their role in this. I think that they were doing pretty much what the Vatican wanted them to do, which was to kind of narrow a sense of orthodoxy around certain moral issues, for instance. Now, nothing wrong with moral issues, but is immigration a moral issue? Is war a moral issue? Is torture a moral issue? Migrants, prison reform, racism, are those moral issues? Um, yet, we tend to have moral concerns focused very n narrowly around issues of sexuality, for instance. Birth control, abortion, I'm not saying that those shouldn't be concerns. What you know, Pope Francis has tried to do is, I think, open you know, the gates to our conception of, of what the moral teaching of the church uh, is. And he doesn't have to, to go back to canon law or, or the compendium of Catholic social teachings or something. He just opens the gospel on almost any page. And the, 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 prior, the, 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 the moral agenda seems to be defined by by mercy, by forgiveness, by openness to, to, to those who are hurting, to identifying with those who are suffering, uh, in a way that put Jesus, as I said, you know, in conflict with those who had the power of their time. Um, and a lot of people are very nervous about, about Pope Francis making that move, obviously. But, and I'm not sure it translates all the way down yet. You know, into the teaching that you 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 hear every day, in, every week, in, in you know, in the Sunday pulpit, and and I think you're right that priests are very nervous about venturing there. And I see, you know, here though, you know, Pope Francis is like like the guy who has gone over the the out of the trench, you know, and is going into no man's land or something and saying, "Who's with me?" Uh, and looking around, and you know, people are just like, "Oh, you know, a little out of our comfort zone." Um, so I, I think that it's difficult to, to go from zero to 60, you know, in just a couple of years. Um, he's been around for five years now, though it's not, not such a short time. Jesus had only three years. Archbishop Romero had only three years. Um, a lot can happen in that time. But Pope Francis's approach also, I have to say, you know, to, to change is he's not, he's, he's one of his favorite sayings is, 
his time is more powerful than space. He's got these little mottos that he loves. He had them before he became Pope, and he, he trotted them out in his first apostolic exhortation. You know, he had a whole bunch of these things he likes to say. Uh, and people think, well, that's just something Pope Francis likes to say. But he's saying that occupying positions of power and from there say, okay, now I'm Pope. I can do whatever I want. I can turn the ship around. Um, I can decree whatever I like. Um, that's not, he's not an, he's, despite what some people might think, he is not an authoritarian. His, his method of change is to plant seeds. Uh, he, he, like with Dorothy, he, with her belief in the little way, he believes in the power of small things, small gestures. And his strategy seems to me to begin to, to try to plant these seeds and to give them time. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Uh, but for now, I think it, it, it results in a certain kind of disconnect uh, between what he's saying and what a lot of American Catholics have come to expect or to understand as the defining identity of, of what it means to be a Catholic. I'm just very curious how, having lived with Dorothy for several years, how did she resolve the issue of being a single parent and yet giving to the world? And how did she, uh, having read her daughter's book, I kind of Brenda. sensed there was, yes, there was a, a kind of a tussle in terms of you my know, mother, sharing my mother with others and how did Dor Dorothy respond to you might say that difficulty uh, and for many single parents that becomes a difficulty how you know how do they give their child attention but also pay attention to the other needs that they have to um, you make reference to probably the best you know answer to that is is the the book that her granddaughter Kate Hennessy wrote called uh, the world will be saved by beauty it's a memoir of her mother Tamar who is Dorothy's uh, single one you know daughter um, and I, I think it's a, a, a masterful book that looks at the complexity of these relationships um, I, um, you know, it's, it's a, if, you, if you look at a lot of the saints, it's hard to, to know whether they were great parents uh, as, as well as everything else they accomplished. I know, you know, I think it was it Jean de Chantal whose son lay on the ground in front of her and said, you know, when she was gonna go off and join what is it, Vincent de Paul, or no, it was a, a, a Francis de Sales, I think, and uh, and she did, you know stepped over him. Um, the um, Dorothy was very resentful when people said, "Well, you know, you don't you don't have a family, you don't know what it's like to have a family." She said, "I have, I have a daughter, I have you know nine grandchildren," and she uh, was very involved with her daughter and with her grandchildren. Uh, who had their own, you know, difficult lives, uh, and I think that that you know her some of her the skills that made her exceptional in leading the Catholic worker, including a sense of figuring out what she thought was right and being able to pursue it. Um, didn't were not necessarily the the the, the, the qualities that that made her a flexible uh, parent. And you can see in that book you know, that often you know, she and her daughter just didn't understand each other. Or at least she didn't understand her daughter. Um, and yet they remained very, very close. Uh, and she cared very, very much about her daughter. It's a, um, it's a struggle that, that uh, all parents you know, face between the, 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 the tension between uh, wanting to control their children, do, knowing what's best for them, but also knowing that ultimately they have to let them go and lead their own lives, make their own mistakes, find their own way. Um, I think that Dorothy, you know, her family was larger than just her, her 
daughter. And it was not just an organization that she led, it was, it was really a family. And many people looked to her as a matriarch and a, and a kind of mother. Uh, she was a very maternal person in my, in my personal experience of her. Um, I remember one time when I was going outside and it was raining outside and she said, you bundle up, you're gonna get yourself uh, cold. And I, and I, and I said, uh, well, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna cry if I get a cold. And she said, well, then you'd be the first man in my experience who didn't. But. <laughs> But there was a real tenderness uh, uh, to her. And she had a, a, a great uh, attraction to young people and an ability to discern our particular gifts. Um, and at least, you know, in my case, uh, you know, as I said, she, uh, when I was, I was 20 years old and she made me a managing editor of the Catholic Worker newspaper. Uh, and, you know, had something to do with, I don't think anybody else wanted the job, but. <laughs> Um, but remarkably, you could say, well, she must have been onto something because this my, became my, my life's work and vocation as a writer and editor, not just a, any old editor, but her editor <laughs> of several books of her writings uh, that have occupied me for all my life. And I, you know, it's amazing when you, uh, when you're a young person like that, the, the, you know, you don't always know the, um, significance of the encounters that are going to be significant in your life on, on, on the, until you kind of look back and see the kind of path that they have illuminated. And I, when I look back and see, you know, it's not my vocation to, to, to work at the Catholic Worker, um, but I feel that uh, you know, a whole life journey uh, that ensued from that encounter when I was 19. Um, here I'll, I'll disclose my age, 62. Uh, you can do the math, and there hasn't been a, a year or a month or a day uh, in that time when I haven't been conscious of the fact that I'm walking on a path that she set me on. Uh, I've been, as I mentioned, I, I'm, I'm one of the two people who have been appointed to the historical commission, so-called, by the archdiocese to prepare her the materials for her cause for canonization. Um, I, it falls to me and this other guy now to write her official biography, which is not really like a biography anybody would want to read. It's a peculiar kind of genre. But, you know, the, again, um, when I think of you know, what she did for me, but I think, you know, of what, it, you know, the, the, the unlikeliness and, and the, the ways of, you know, kind of providence and grace that, uh, that she was, you know, meeting in me, that kid back then, a person who would then have this awesome responsibility 40 years later to, to be uh, promoting her, her, her holiness to the world. Um, so uh, I, I, if you read if you read the, the Kate's book, maybe you saw at the at the end. Um, she, she describes the conversations that Tamar, Dorothy's daughter, and I had before Tamar died, where she um, I was working on Dorothy's diaries. And I heard indirectly that Tamar was stirring up a lot of, of difficult emotions for, 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 for Tamar. And I called her and said, um, you know, is there something in particular you, you would rather I not include in the book? Because there are references to her difficulties in her marriage and that sort of thing. And it was really more, you know, the, I understood better when I then later read the, the letters, Dorothy's letters, I edited that, and some of the letters to, to Tamara when she was a young girl, you know, in high school and stuff, and Dorothy kind of bossing her around and telling her what to do and everything. It gave me a better understanding of where that unresolved stress was in her life. And, you know, we talked about it, and I said, you know, I, I, I've read enough of this now that I, I think I understand, you know, your, your feelings about this. I, I can see how it seems like a lot of times Dorothy didn't really understand what made you tick. And, and something about just hearing from me that I understood that, like, relieved her in some way. And she, we went on to have this beautiful conversation where she talked how much she loved the Catholic worker and loved uh, Dorothy. Her husband hated the Catholic worker, and that was very difficult. But um, she said, well, you, you just do whatever you want with it. You just do whatever I trust you. And okay, so then, you know, a couple of days later, she called me back. And I was, and her kid said, Tamara never called anybody. And she was, you know, very close to the end of her life at this point, not well. Apparently she had been in difficulty sleeping. She had terrible stress and stomach problems and pain and all this kind of thing. 
and they said, you know, after that conversation with you, she completely relaxed. And she called me back and she said, I just wanted to make sure you understood what I said, that I, I totally trust you to do whatever you want with the stuff. And then she died just uh, very shortly after that. And I think in, 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 in peace, and she'd kind of come to a full circle in her own life. Um, Kate's book is very beautiful. She writes about how Dorothy had prayed to be with her own mother when she died, as she was, and how Tamar was with uh, Dorothy when she died, and how Kate uh, was with her mother Tamar when she died. And there's uh, this beautiful story of these kind of mother lines. Um, it's a book, apart from interest in Dorothy Day, that I think is, is really important. It's just won a Christopher Award, I'm, I'm, I'm told. It deserves to be widely read. All right. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I thought halfway through this, um, this being the Easter time, that for me anyway, our, our hearts were burning inside us because we listened to words about a, a call to holiness. Um, we listened to words about Dorothy Day and Oscar Romero. And I think we, many of us, would have thought we knew these two amazing people. But now we know how much more there is to know. And your insight and your words brought them to us this evening. And for this, we are very grateful. Very grateful. I think when you talked about that each of us are called, encouraged, and challenged to that call, which I just said before, to holiness, to be a Christ follower, is something that we walk out of here this evening um, remembering, uh, worrying that we're not quite there yet, and wanting very much to be, to, to encourage each other in that world. So thank you. I can't wait to read another one, that last book you talked about. I haven't read that. I read all the others. Um, if anyone is interested, there is, uh, they're both in the back of the room and up here, a list of Robert Ellsberg's books. So saw it on the piano in the back of this room. And um, as you leave this evening, well, before you leave, I want to remind you that on September 25th, uh, the second uh, lecture. Uh, we have Elizabeth Johnson coming, and if you haven't heard her, you owe it to yourself. And she will speak, this is a most amazing title, It's God's Charity Broad Enough for Bears. I'm not, mis it's not a mistake. Uh, she will speak to Laudato Si, Pope Francis's um, exhortation on the environment. So, as you leave this evening, remind, remember that we're very happy that you were here. As you leave and you walk down that hall, you can get out of this building in a couple of ways. But if you go all the way down and make a left, and there'll be people guiding that, you can walk past a wonderful art show. It puts you closer to the uh, parking lot, and maybe you'll stay a little drier. So, Godspeed, thank you for coming, and we hope to see you again.